Okay. Okay, um, well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, um, Ms. Gideon, Mr. Usher, and Dr. Chamberlain. All representatives um, joining us this morning from different organizations and um, stakeholders across the doing business environment in Belize. This morning, um, we will be featuring one of the webcasts as part of the of series, uh, Mequitak Business in Belize. And for this morning, um, our title is Making It Count in CARICOM. So this morning, we want to explore different opportunities that there are in CARICOM in terms of goods and also speaking a little bit more on the opportunities that there are also in the services sector. So um, we're already live on Facebook. Um, thank you for uh, thank you everyone again for joining us. And um, this morning, um, as a brief introduction, we have Ms. Tricia Gideon this morning representing the Directorate for Foreign Trade. We have Dr. Um, Chamber Dion Chamberlain joining us from the Belize Coalition of Service Providers, and we also have Mr. Usher from Citrus um, Products of Belize Limited. So each one of them will be sharing expertise on what their experience has been so far in terms of exporting to CARICOM, working with different stakeholders here in Belize, but also regionally um, as per CARICOM member states. So this morning to start off, we're gonna be hearing from Ms. Gideon, who will speak to us about the um, CT suspension and what it is um, for for us that don't know much about it, she will be explaining on what the CET suspension is and the different opportunities that it has for exporters seeking um, give provide us an overview of the CET suspension and what it all entails. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Leanne. So the CET is called the Common External Tariff, and it is a schedule of tariff rates that are applied uniformly by a, com by a common market, example, CARICOM, to import from countries outside the common market. So for CARICOM, it ranges from zero to 40%. Belize, as a member of CARICOM, can import most of its goods from other CARICOM member states duty-free. But this CET import, this CET could could be suspended upon application and approval by a CARICOM member state if, this, if it is a good that we wish to acquire that's not in the community. This means that the external tax by the CARICOM countries will no longer be applied and a CARICOM member state can import a good at a cheaper rate from a non-CARICOM member state, for example, Mexico. So if we want to import sugar, refined sugar, from Brazil or Mexico or the US, we will request the CET suspension and this will allow us to import sugar from these non-CARICOM countries at either a lower rate or a 0% rate. So it's really this mechanism is a way for member states to identify opportunities for products that are in demand and not supplied in CARICOM. Okay, perfect. And then in terms of, um, so when Belize would receive a CET update, how is it that it's channeled through the different, um, you know, current producers? How is it being promoted? So the process is initiated by the private sector. And the private sector in member states, through their ministers of trade, make a request for the derogation of the CET to the CARICOM Secretariat on specific goods they wish to acquire outside the CARICOM region. So there is this formal request being done that's channeled through the government. And the request, the CARICOM Secretariat, as the middleman or middle person, sends a formal request via the Ministry of Trade in member states. So it comes to the Ministry of Trade in Belize. And they ask that we consult with the private sector on the specific good for quantity or quality. They ask that if we have it available to also provide the supplier's contact information so that the private sector can now interact with that of the private sector entity. And if we don't have it right now, but we plan to have it in the future to indicate that time. Member states have about seven days to respond to this request with an acceptance or an objection. Belize currently, when we, we currently compile all of this CT request, 
So we, we compiled the request so that we can share it with relevant private sector agencies. And one of our challenges many times is identifying the companies that may have some interest in it, but are unable to uh, meet the demand at the time. Okay, I see. And then in terms of the products that are listed, what are some of the opportunities or that you continuously see on a continuous basis? And um, I'm not sure how often do you receive the CD suspension? Okay, so they come as often as the private sector needs a product. So they might come once a month, they might come twice a week, they could come three times a week or maybe once every three months. It all depends on the needs of the private sector in each of these CARICOM member states. This 2019, 2019, sorry, we had about eight member states that requested um, CET suspension. And some of the goods that I'm going to list have to do with the number of times they requested it and the amounts. So they're in large quantities. So we had from Barbados, Dominica, Guyana, Jamaica, Suriname, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and Trinidad in 2019. And some of the products were palm oil, like Barbados requested that, corn oil, Dominica wanted palm oil, turmeric powder, and many of these products are products that we can supply, but unfortunately not in the quantity they request. Um, what we find with Guyana and, and Jamaica, they request a lot of puree products guava puree, um, mango, eh, pineapple. So there are so many things here that we can produce because we are considered the breadbasket of Belize. For Jamaica, raw frozen pigtails, something uh, uh, a staple of ours. <laughs> they have Jamaica request turmeric powder, aloe vera. We look at um, St. Lucia, white pepper seeds. If you look at St. Vincent, molasses which is something we can produce. Suriname usually requests certain minerals. Granite is one of their biggest requests, but they do also request soap powder. Trinidad, peanuts, something that's viable for us. Soya bean oil, what you find a lot of. Trinidad requests a lot of oil, sunflower oil, coconut oil. And so these are things that the private sector can look at and see, can, can we invest in this? Is it worthwhile? Depending on the, the trends and the number of times the private sector makes this request. And even things like lumber or chair parts. So those are some of the products that are demanded um, annually. Right. I totally agree with you, Tricia, in terms of the opportunities that they are for Belize. Um, you were mentioning different fruits, and here in Belize, we're widely known, you know, to have a variety of fruits. And I yes. can certainly see the opportunity for, you know, the production of purees, and like you mentioned, even in terms of forestry products. Um, given that Belize is known widely to produce, you know, for specific niche markets and yes. um, for specific niche products too. Um, but all in all, in engaging the private sector, what have been some of the major constraints or issues that they have expressed in terms of meeting these demands, given that I know that a lot of them are coming in continuously on a continuous basis? Well, from the private sector point of view, you have to ensure that that market is secure and that people will buy that product. So it's like the egg and the chicken. Should they make the investment now and hope that it will meet the standards and the quality that the private sector in Trinidad wants? Or is this a one-time demand? And that's why it's important when the private sector looks at the data. It's don't only look at it for 2019, but look at it from 2015 to 2019. What, has, what are some of the products that have continuously showed up and then make that contact with the private sector there in that member state to see if you can negotiate a, a contract or a deal that will allow you to feel safe or secure in beginning an investment to this scale. Because for example, refined sugar or any investment in maybe you want to start producing chair parts as we're looking at the furniture industry. It's not a small investment. And so in people have to feel secure that they have the protection of the community, that the CET will remain in place to protect this good in the community. And member states also have to do their part in supporting other member states. 
So it's just allowing people feel safe. Right now, they're huge investments and the private sector may not feel secure enough to make these investments. Right. Um, so basically, if we take a look at it, it's, um, it's, two, it two, it's twofold. In one, that government, we can, you know, let them know these are the opportunities and these are the, are the products. But at the same time, it's important for private sector to do additional due diligence. Um, mm -hmm. Like you mentioned, it's important to have to be a little bit more proactive in engaging perhaps these private entities who continuously place these products on demand to ask, like you mentioned again, what it is that you're looking for and also any um, potential contracts that can be established. So I certainly see, you know, the connection and the, um, and the proactiveness that has to be both from government and also from private sector. Um, but um, with that too in line, Tricia, in terms of um, have, when engaging private sector, besides of, you know, the financial constraint to whether to invest or not, have they ever mentioned any additional support that they would need from government to perhaps, you know, take advantage of these opportunities? Well, every sector is different and every sector will identify some of the support that they need to take advantage of this. So if you look maybe at the, the furniture sector, they need assistance with training, with people to assist them to develop that sector and to create quality wood, not only for the local sector, but for the region. And um, they need standards in place. They need support there as well. Um, they need people, they need more people in the sector that understands how to do things like and like this. So, and also they need government support to put in place, as I mentioned earlier, the taxes that will slow down some of the importation of outside furniture, if we want to protect the sector, right? That's just an example. And it's for any sector that we want to invest in. So those are some of the things that they might identify, just additional trading, um, amendment to some of the taxes, um, do yeah. different inputs so some things like that they would request and now that you mention it too it's a very tricky situation um when we take a look at um given that we are a CARICOM member state it's not easy as a government you know representative to just say well okay we can waive these taxes or we can waive these these services mm. because it takes a lot more and um Tracy, i'm sure you know a lot about it that it we would also need to conduct various consultations with the different member states to see if it's something that they would consider so um with that Tricia, are there any other opportunities in terms of goods that you would see um, as, you know, emerging in the CARICOM market? Well, there are many other goods, but I didn't want to list all of them here and take up time as, and I can share this, this list. And I know that our office works closely with Bell Trade in sharing this list, but there are a number. It's not only the oil and the lumber, um, there are lots of spices. Um, there are, are lots of oils. Like I mentioned the furniture, there are um, a lot of agricultural products. So there are many um, goods that we can take advantage of. And, and we uh, are actually working on a, a booklet, which we hope to finalize this year, that will put forward all of these items. Um, and we will also list the HS code, which is a harmonized code for these products, because that's important too, that the private sector know that you just don't ask for a product, you ask for a specific product that must have an HS code so that we can help you even better. So that's important. And we'll and we'll list the countries making this request because it's it's good to know where the demand is coming from. So we should have that information fully available um, for the public. But of course, you could contact the office and their trade intelligence unit will provide that information for you. But we just wanted ease of access. So we'll do a booklet to disseminate that information. Okay, well, that's excellent, Tricia, and um, the various initiatives by the DGFT too are very much commendable, and we certainly look forward to that booklet, which will certainly serve as a guide, you know, in knowing the um, technicalities on what would be required, or at least just the basic knowledge on what would be required to enter or explore these um, opportunities in CARICOM markets. Um, but 
in moving forward too, um, given that you are the expert both in goods and also services, we want to speak a little bit on the opportunities that they are in terms of the services sector. How, what has been the experience um, so far in terms of uh, the opportunities that are arising in the services sector, you know, before the pandemic and now what are some of the opportunities that are arising amidst the um, pandemic? All right, so um, the good sector is actually easier to engage because it's tangible, right? When we come to the services sector, we either intentionally ignore it or we feel that it's less important because it's intangible. But in fact, the services sector supports the trade in goods sector a lot. And the region, CARICOM, has identified seven sectors that they feel should be supported more and these sectors are ITC, professional services, postal and courier services, sports, culture and entertainment, education and spa and wellness. And these sectors are not only important for CARICOM, they are important for the CARIFORUM region and CARIFORUM is CARICOM plus the Dominican Republic. And we signed an agreement with the EU which resulted in the economic partnership agreement. And I mentioned that because that agreement provides a financial and technical support. And they are giving us support, both financial and technical, to further develop these seven sectors that should help to advance our integration process. So there are opportunities in these sectors. And this year, the Director General did many consultations with the private sector and public sector with these, five, with these seven implementation plans. And these seven implementation plans look at areas that need to be improved. So for example, legislation, the use of IT across the board in all of these sectors, which is more than important right now during this COVID crisis, enhancement of e-governance policies, um, we're looking at how you can improve standards in these sectors. So, and which is very important because for example, with COVID, how do you improve um, construction workers' live, livelihoods if you don't have guidelines in place and protocols? So we're trying to take a harmonized approach um, to address some of these issues. So these are our priority areas and these are also the sectors that have opportunities because of the company funding with them. And later this month, we'll meet again with the region to discuss some immediate measures that need to be taken to support um, the recovery of member states' economies. Certainly, and um, you mentioned right now seven sectors, you know, in terms of services. And I think for everyone, when we think about services, specifically here in Belize, we would think, you know, the tourism industry, um, services that are there in terms of the hospitality sector, but all in one, there are so many services that are being offered in the CARICOM markets and even worldwide. Um, I, uh, during my works at Bell Trade, I have always been passionate to work with the con with the contact centers because um, these are some of the services you know that are being offered and the export of services, but it's not only the basic business process outsourcing services that we commonly know, but in CARICOM, it's very popular to hear about legal process outsourcing, knowledge process outsourcing, you know, having attorneys export their services to different clients across the region. So um, it's important to note, like you mentioned, the different sectors and the different opportunities that each one of them may have. Um, but just to delve a little bit more in these, Tricia, can you explain to us a little bit um, or just an overview of each sector and what would be some examples of the services that would be tied into each one of them? So with these seven sectors, as I had mentioned, not to go in detail, but what is cross-cutting with all seven is one, how do we use IT better in all of them? Because now we have to move our work online. What do you need? to get your service online and what support does the region need to give for that and your country. Um, two, legislation. So if we look at the ITC sector, which is going to assist all sectors across the country, what legislation is pending that needs our support right now? 
So signature, e-signatures, we need to ensure that they're valid and viable um, for contracts that we make. So we have to ensure that the e-commerce legislation is in place to support the sector, cyber security. Um, so data protection, all of these need to be in place. And standards, again, how are you, what are you doing to adopt or to develop standards? And what help do you need in these areas? Because all of these sectors speak to that and having a strategy to carry that out. And one of the big ones is marketing promotion of your sector. Like for example, when we sat down with the education department, there are so many things that the Ministry of Education is doing, yet they're not marketing what they're doing. And so we are unaware of their needs, their challenges, um, their lack of resources. And so it's something that we are requesting that people tell us what are your needs? Because if you can itemize them, we can share them with possible funders. And that's all we can do. We can just ask you and we can share and continue to lobby on your behalf. And uh, most certainly there are so many um, potential opportunities in terms of tapping into funding. And you mentioned something very important, that's communication. How is it that you know we communicate with one another? These are the different areas that we need assistance in. Um, three of the items that you know, ring a bell continuously to me that you mentioned is one is data security. That is essential in terms of the trading services. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of companies or even companies when trading, you know, they tell you, does your company, does your country have any laws, regulations that speak on data security? And for the most part, if a country doesn't have these, then a lot of them would say, well, maybe it's too early for me to trade um, with you. Maybe we can take a look after your, um, you know, you guys have developed these, these policies. And in terms of education, this is so important because the more and more we have these services coming on board, then it means that we also need to get our um, graduates, uh, our um, labor pool, the talent pool up to par to what, are, to what is being demanded out there. So I certainly see, you know, the, um, how is it that each one of them ties to it? Um, and then with that, lastly, the standards, that's always um, key and important when engaging with different companies and even potential clients, they ask, you know, what are some of the standards that you adhere to, whether it's regionally, whether it's in your country or also internationally. Some of these standards can be voluntary, some of them can be involuntary. So um, it's key to do an assessment to see how we can best work out for the yes. sector on a whole across the different, you know, um, whether it's in tourism, whether it's in business process outsourcing, or um, like you mentioned, the technical workers in construction mm -hmm. and just across board. So um, with that, Tricia, um, and based on your experience, how do you guys normally get, um, like for goods, for example, we know about the different demands through the CT suspension, but in terms of services, how does that work? How do we find out on these opportunities? Or is there a channel that we can, you know, tap into to know, well, these are the opportunities, this is what is being looked for in CARICOM markets? Okay, so how do you access these, these opportunities? If you're from the private sector, and you, you would know that you have to do your market research. You have to know the market you, you have. So if you want to enter Barbados, you need to know about Barbados. You need to know what they want. You need to know if you meet their standards. Uh, you need to do your thorough research before you start supplying a service there. You also need to determine the mode of supply. So services is traded through four modes of supply. Are you going to trade your service with Barbados through mode one, that is through the internet? And like you mentioned earlier, am I going to do this because I have a great IT infrastructure or will I be unable to do this uh, at the moment, but I plan on doing it later on? Mode two, do you want people to come to you and access your service? Or mode three, you want to go and set up a business in Barbados because you think that's more viable to be a dentist in, um, in Barbados or a consultant. Or mode four, you're just going to move around the entire CARICOM region supplying your service. 
And so that's, you have to decide how are you going to do that and what's the most feasible way and profitable way for you to do that. And then you have to network. I mean, you have to make your contacts with these different organizations and with private individuals. The directorate here, we send out as many opportunities that come our way to the private sector and share with them um, these opportunities. But that is, those are first things that you have to do if you want to access the market. Of course, the government has in place different systems to facilitate movement of these people. Um, and if we have time, I can go further into that. But these are the things that you would have to do if you want to access first these opportunities. And to see if you meet the standard, you have the qualifications. Maybe you are a consultant, maybe you are a doctor, but you don't meet the standards or the qualifications for that project or that opportunity in that other member state. Right. And um, you just mentioned the movement of people. So uh, we would be delighted to hear, you know, what does that entail? What does that mean? And how can it benefit Belize? So within the CSME, um, we have five areas or five regimes in place. There are two regimes that could facilitate um, individuals as they try to supply services. One is the provision of services, which is a certificate of a service provider. Unfortunately, Belize has not fully operationalized this area, but we have the skill certificate, which is another area of the CSME, fully operationalized. And the skill certificate is a certificate that's issued to CARICOM nationals who hold a CARICOM passport. And once you get the skill certificate in any of the 13 CSMB participating member states, you can live and work indefinitely, forever, in any of these 13 <laughs> member states. And that is going to assist you if you want to trade through any of the four modes mentioned. So you can see Jamaica as a potential market and say, I want to go there and supply and see how it works for me. When you arrive in Jamaica, you're automatically given a six-month stay. And once your skill certificate is verified by whichever entity is designated to verify, Ministry of Trade, Foreign Affairs, or Immigration, you can live there forever. And there is a social security system in place where wherever you live in CARICOM and wherever you decide to retire, your social security benefits will follow you. So we want you to move. And this helps you to move, right? So this is one system in place that assists. And you can apply here in Belize at the Immigration Department in Belmopan. The fee is $225, and you bring your company documents, your CARICOM passport, if you're married, a three um, picture passports, three, what should I say, three passport pictures, and you fill out the form and you pay the money and you get a skill certificate that's forever, that it has no expiration date. And you can, this can assist you as you move. You don't have to deal with immigration fees. You don't, no one's going to harass you if you're in Jamaica too long because you belong there. And you should be treated as a, a CARICOM national. So you, you have to be treated fairly like any other national would be treated. And then the other regime that few people take um, advantage of, but still a very important one, is the rights of establishment, which is simply setting up a business in another member state. So if you feel at some point that you want to establish a business in a member state, we will facilitate that process for you. Um, every member state has their own rules. So for Belize, we facilitate all CARICOM nationals that are not from Belize, because we are CARICOM nationals. And if we want to go to another member state, let's say Trinidad, we simply contact Trinidad for you, and then they have their focal point there that can assist you in setting up your business there. And for Belize, we only request eight documents, but other member states may request a little bit more. But it's important to know that they should treat you like a person from Trinidad if you want to set up a business in Trinidad. And we're here to support you if they don't. <laughs> well, that sounds excellent. Sounds like we should look into perhaps exploring one of those um, countries, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> and I just want to know that we have a booklet online that the region developed. It's on our website www.dgft.gov.bz and this book like talks about facilitation of travel for CARICOM nationals and all of the five areas and five regimes I spoke I mentioned it's in there 
and it um, talks about it in detail. And one thing I want to mention before I go is that services, especially in 10 categories of persons, can move. So you have persons who hold a, a graduate degree, or you have people who are in the arts area, artists, musicians, media people, or sports person, or a domestic worker. Um, all of these people, nurses, teachers who don't have a degree can move. Those are the 10 approved categories. So you can apply for a skill certificate and live and work in these other countries. So it's important to know that as well. Okay, sounds excellent then, Tricia. And thank you very much for all the knowledge and the expertise shared in terms of the opportunities that exist in terms of goods, um, products being produced here in Belize, and also in terms of services. You know, we always take a look at the um, goods and the different um, potential markets, but also in terms of services, there are so many opportunities that we can tap into. So thank you very much for sharing all of that, Tricia. And for our viewers, if you'd like to know more information about it, feel free to visit the web uh, the website for the Directorate General for Foreign Trade in Belize. So Tricia, thank you very much. And now, um, speaking again on, in, on services, we want to welcome Dr. Dion Chamberlain, who is the chairman of the Belize Coalition of Service Providers to also share insights on, you know, opportunities that exist in terms of the trade and services, but more from the private sector, um, from the private sector stand um, point of view. How has it been working for the private sector? But without further ado, say, um, Dr. Chamberlain. Um, I believe your mic might be okay, it okay now. Is yes, that better? It's okay now. Yeah. Thank you so much. And like I said, thank you all very much for having us. Um, we are um, the information that Trisha spent um, spoke about. Some of it I had included, so I'll just um, probably move to those very quickly. Um, however, I wanted to um, become a bit more relevant and speak in reference to what we are facing, also in line with COVID nineteen, because. Although we were working um, and trading within the Caribbean region um, pre-COVID-19, a lot of the situations have changed quite a bit. And I'd like to share with you some of the things that we're looking at, but at the same time, some of the services that we'll be able to offer to anyone who is still interested in exporting into the region, along with all of the support that Tricia just mentioned. Um, so the very the, the first thing um, that I think is absolutely important for us to realize, um, and and some of this was taken from actually a, um, a forum that we did yesterday with Trisha and the entire Caribbean region in understanding the new storm and what is the new normal. So we do realize that things shifted and changed um, extremely um, to a large extent um, in March. And I must say that within the Caribbean region, we had very swift response by our governments in all areas. In, and in fact, I think we rivaled quite a bit the rest of the world in terms of our responses. And we had swift responses from banks, which is one of the key areas where the service sector highly relies on. And within services, we had to change the business operation. And I'm sure within the, the product and manufacturing side, quite a bit had to occur. And of course, there was a significant loss of income. But I must say, for the service sector, although there were new threats, there are also a lot of great new opportunities that we were able to take advantage of, and I want to share that with you. Um, I don't need to get into the modes of supply because I believe that Trisha got into that quite seriously, but it's very important because a lot of people don't even realize that they are trading in services and they are trading regionally and some internationally. In fact, um, in terms of... of, of um, our firm, my per, um, personal private firm, um, we work for a lot of foreign investors and uh, members like Areb, who um, works in, in the realtor area, works a lot with foreign investment. And so reality, we are large um, um, earners of foreign exchange through the country as well in terms of certain areas that we, that we work in. And so for all different aspects of it, um, we have to understand that although we may not physically have moved, like Trisha mentioned, um, you're looking at um, 
only if the service crosses the border, yes. Um, and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes it doesn't have to any longer. In fact, um, within the consulting environment right now where cross-border um, movement is needed, we're also realizing that with great networking, we can actually create relationships with IT firms in the other countries so that we can perform their services that they're needing to do in Belize because they had previous contracts that they have to fulfill now. So Belizeans have gained those opportunities in fulfilling those contracts locally, which weren't even our jobs in the beginning. And as well in terms of consulting, um, we need to network and form those relationships throughout the um, region so that we can ensure that we can continue to provide that service. And of course, in the commercial presence where we rely on the manufacturing, the product side that, that um, Mr. Usher will be speaking about. And of course, the movement of, of natural persons um, in terms of where the service provider actually goes abroad. Again, there are these many different areas in terms of the modes that we need to look at. But what is really important for us um, to be realizing is that no matter where it is, we have to look at the physical implications right now um, in reference to how do we provide these transactions, physical proximity um, with the service and the consumer. And so those are areas that have been impacted. However, they are, um, forcing us to be a lot more creative. And I must say that because we've worked along with a lot of, of international um, aid agencies, we were doing quite a bit of virtual servicing from way before COVID-19. So it's really where we make it a natural norm into how it is that we are going to be moving um, these services. So it's important for us to realize that 60% of Belize's revenue is really from services and um, we have to understand, like um, Trisha mentioned, that symmetry, that um, support, because for every manufacturing firm, there is a service company which is providing that software, that design, that engineering, that delivery. And I'm glad that Trisha also mentioned um, the maritime aspect of it. And yes, we are focusing on the EPA and all of those different areas, but the infrastructure also has to be in place when we are providing that level of service, which is why it's important that we have a, a functioning um, port which can provide the quality of service to be able to, for us to be able to engage in these other type parts of the product market, which will then, then lead into other areas of work that the service industry can be looking at. So, um, the really looking at how it is that we can support each other. And so it's important for the service sector to be on the agenda of the industry sector and vice versa so that we can create those opportunities and that are being enabled from either side so that we can create jobs for each other. In fact, last year, um, the, um, the bar, actually it was this year, I, I guess the year is flying so Pass. I'm not really realizing it, but the Barbados Investment Development Corporation came to Belize to try and set up meaningful linkages on a product perspective. They wanted to get raw materials for their value chain in terms of their level of production because they don't really produce a lot agriculturally. However, as they came into Belize, they needed to work with a lot of different service sectors and, and service organizations and businesses so that they could actually um, be able to even do their field work in Belize. So many different areas profited, such as custom brokers, um, transportation agencies, the tourism entities, restaurants and all of that. So I want for everybody to realize that once you're engaged in any kind of foreign transaction um, with any company abroad or locally that is working back and forth and bringing in foreign exchange, you are exporting your services. And so it's important for us to realize that. Um, now, I wanted to really mention the impact of COVID on the trade in services. And um, we do, I have it on the screen in reference to mode one, mode two, mode three, and mode four. And I want you to, um, to really look at, in the Caribbean, we, although we are impacted, we are still least impacted according to the World Trade Organization standards. Of course, I must say, um, this data comes from UNCTAD and some of it, because we don't report heavily within the Caribbean area, some of the information may be a little skewed. However, because we are smaller um, island states and we're, uh, and 
countries, we are able to rebound faster, but we have to be a lot more creative in our thinking. And so um, there are different areas that we can look at within the travel sector. Now in CARICOM service statistics, um, the, we only have information up until 2018. And um, we were looking at a growth of 14.1% over the next five years. However, that did not consider COVID-19. And so we will have to go back to the drawing board and get some of that data that is required. And in fact, we are currently doing um, throughout the coalitions, and I'm not sure if you're aware, but the Belize Coalition of Service Providers, we are a coalition that operates within Belize. However, we are a group of coalitions throughout the entire Caribbean um, states. And right now we're doing a post-COVID impact assessment in reference to our local memberships, which will be aggregated and shared. And then that way we will actually be able to see on the service sector, because I realize that everyone is doing post-COVID-19 information, but they're not segregating the data. And we really need to understand um, the, the, the information on a service versus uh, industry and product um, perspective. So um, when we look um, at the, out of the, the information, it shows us that the impact on small businesses are going to be the greatest. And one out of four small businesses in these developing countries like Belize will close permanently due to COVID-19 crisis. However, this data doesn't show the number of small businesses that will be doing better because of their willingness to innovate and shift. When Darwin spoke about not being the most intelligent that will survive, but it's those who are most flexible and adaptable to change, COVID-19 really exacerbates that, that um, quote um, in the reality that people were able to switch. And I think that um, Dr. Almendares spoke heavily about that yesterday um, while he was on OYE. And so it's very important for us to, to realize that yes, there will be closures, but there are going to be a lot of business opportunities. And I think that we also need to aggregate those numbers and see where are the startups, not only where the closed downs are, because we are quite able to look at the negative side of things, but where are we in looking at the positive sides and where we're really going as particular countries. So on an export planning and COVID-19, there are several different areas that we need to start to consider now, which we never, we, we looked at, but we never delved at. And so um, for the service sector, these are some of the things that we need to be looking at. Um, in terms of um, the placing the support services through the pandemic, the social distancing, how it will affect us, how can we really move towards more online sales of services because products are, have been way ahead of time in doing that. However, webinars like you're doing right now, but how do we monetize it on a Caribbean perspective? Because I must say that Northern America, because of tunnel marketing, has been very good at marketing and monetizing um, the online presence of services, but we were really doing it as an addition and as a marketing tool, as you all do at Beltrade. However, we do have to get into the side where we look at the monetization, but that again, the synergy that Trisha mentioned, where banks have to become on board and allow us that payment facility that is needed so that we can monetize these um, services online that we're providing right now. We also need to look at how we can add value to domestic agriculture, manufacturing, and of course the service sectors. But I want to tell you, like Trisha mentioned, services are, although they contribute so heavily, are forgotten. We are not really on the table of the large business organizations in Belize. I think services are added on uh, onto acronyms for the sake of it, and we're not really an important factor. However, um, the countries have to start um, aggregating what revenue on a foreign exchange perspective is brought in on a service sector. And then, and actually we are seeing that from the pinch we are facing right now within the local environment. So I believe that all of the, we have to start taking services a lot more seriously. And, I, and, I, and I'm so excited that the Director General for Foreign Trade has been so supportive throughout the years and Bell Trade as well. And although um, I know that the demand comes more from the, from the product side that you have focused quite um, making sure that we always have a stage and a, and a page on your agenda. And I thank you all for that. But we have to also look at the reassurances our customers need during these uncertain times. And that is a service perspective. And so the manufacturing and the agriculture and all of that, although they're good at providing product, they haven't been good at 
assuring their customers of stability for the future. And this is where um, utilizing our services to create that assurance is where it is absolutely needed right now. And I think that Trisha also mentioned it in terms of marketing. What customized services can be offered to these different areas to secure the, the markets they had? And that is where service plays its role again. So with travel restrictions in place, we have to look at how has the customer purchasing been affected? How is the target market managing the pandemic? What is the response to foreign supplies, goods and services? Or is every country going to be like Belize and pushing buy in Belize campaign or buy in Barbados or buy in wherever campaigns? We have to be careful that the campaigns that we push locally don't affect the outside market because they're looking at us and we're saying buy in Belize, so we're saying not buy from them. So then when they start to become productive, protective, we rule out a <laughs> large part of our market. And we have to be careful of that because um, when I say don't buy from you, that you're then saying, I'm not gonna buy from you either. So our jargon and our messaging during these pandemics have to be very careful and that's where our marketing comes into place. And again, I see it very avidly. I see every day we're saying buy in Belize, but we're only thinking products. Every talk show I've watched every day in Belize has not been focusing on protecting our service industry. In fact, locally in Belize, I found it amazing that so many large companies in Belize don't use Belizean consultants. They're not even using Belizean lawyers. They're not using Belizean banks for funding. They're not using Belizean IT companies for setup. In fact, we within the service sector have found it more of an open market and an embracing market on the international regional perspective to be able to trade and gain the rightful revenue share that we are looking for in services abroad. Because, and I'm sure that, that a lot of the large organizations, governmental and non-governmental, can really look at the consultants they have fired and it has mostly been foreign. Even on a realtor perspective, every aspect, we are not looking. And so I would like, honestly, for us to contemplate and concentrate. If we're gonna be pushing a buy local, buy local in services, but just remember, don't turn off the international market from buying because they need to buy from someone and everyone will become protectionist if we only start pushing our local part of the market. Now, many people have asked for a repository on where information is. I want you all to know that there is a COVID-19 trade facilitation resource repository and it's located at the website here. And I'd want for you all to realize that the Caribbean region on a service perspective is working on harmonization, is working on standardization, is working on all of these because they value working as a service sector. And I can tell you the networking within the Belize um, Coalition of Service Providers and the facilities which are available are important because out of all of this whole trade environment, networking is one going to be one of the best and the most meaningful aspects to keeping our relationships intact. And so as we look at the creative and cultural industries sector growth, which is one of the important areas of the EPA, we have to look at the annual growth over the next five years and where do we see it going. And I want, and I, and I like that Trisha mentioned education as well, because even on a, on a um, educational perspective, we have to understand that right now virtual re um, reality, OTT videos, internet advertising, video games and sports, these are the ones that are taking by storm. In fact, these are the companies that are um, really thriving during COVID-19 because they're entertaining our youth and our people while they're in lockdown and they don't have physical proximity, by the way, which will be a two to three year reality. So Belize and our educational institutions have to start preparing people for virtual. And I'm proud of, of, of companies like Jankuno Productions, which will be doing a laugh off series on Friday night. Um, of our music agency under James Sanka, which has launched virtual um, concerts because the reality is that we need to create the payment platforms for the service industry to actually be able to thrive. And I want to ask the manufacturing and the industry perspective, sponsor these service industry environments and your, your product and service will go viral because for instance, um, the first music sector concert that um, that James Sanker launched along with the Belize Music Agency within um, COVID-19 had 64,000 viewers 
watching it. How many of our marketing and advertising will get that in terms of our look? So again, look at the service industry and what we're doing because we are pivoting and making the shifts required. So within the creative and cultural industries, we're looking at um, the economy becoming more increasingly digitized. And when you look at the global digital revenue up until 2022, it'll be 56.9% of the, of the um, economy. And this is why on an educational perspective, we need to look at these different segments. Like I mentioned earlier, live music events and COVID-19, live concerts are gonna be on hold. And according to Live Nation, the largest, largest music promoter in the world, 91% of us want to return to concerts. So what will concerts look like? There will be drive-in concerts where you stay locked up in your car in a big field. So huge fields in Belize can benefit from this. We can go to movies and cinemas in a large football field drive-in. Imagine old time stuff coming back to life. <laughs> um, live stream shows like this one, media collaborations, pay-per-view events, exclusive concerts. This is where the music industry is headed to. And this is where we can look forward to in terms of continuing to export our services and exporting it even as far as San Pedro, if you want to call that an export. But the reality is it's, it's, it's regional, it's national, it's global. And the diaspora is wide and open, willing to be able to take on what it is that we're providing. I'm excited also about the spa and wellness aspect of it. And also about um, Bell Trades, um, with the launch of the Belize Mayan Spa Experience, exporting without leaving. Every day I get approached to come and do a Swedish massage. I can't wait for when I'm seeing it on Groupon and all of these different areas, a Belize Mayan Spa Experience. Because the reality is Belize will be getting residual income from that intellectual property and copywriting registration by just having our name mentioned in all of those different areas. And so that is exportation without even physical traveling to these areas. So getting our products, I mean, sorry, our services and the products that will be linked back to a Mayan spa experience on an export perspective is even more key at this point in time. So the trends that we have to follow is the slow, sustainable, and more private travel. And although I mean, a lot of our countries are saying that we're not really looking at Airbnbs and Vacasa, I want you all to know people are more safe traveling to a home environment where they understand cleanliness standards and a lot of people aren't moving and staying within those spaces. So I really am pushing and I'm looking at the tourism sector to look at wellness in the home, partner with villas, guest houses to enhance experience. And of course, the adoption of international health and safety standards have to be a must. So we don't need to recreate and create our own standards in country. Why can't we work with the international health and safety standards? Because international health and safety standards are what our travelers want. Yes, we have to have standards at home, but we don't need to reinvent wheels and come up with a lot of new standards. Let's try and adopt the international standards, which will be um, showing that we are accredited and that we can provide services in that particular environment. And I want you all to also know that within a spa and wellness, tourism and COVID-19 responses, we have resources um, for spa guidelines, how to open your salon, due to experiences for massage therapists, for spa sanitation, cleaning, hypothermal areas, all of these things exist. We don't need to reinvent the wheel because because of being a part of a coalition of service providers, we are providing these tools for members according and over the areas of the service sector. So looking at the customer profile online, spending power, attitude, attitude towards foreign goods and services, the perception, health and safety, and of course the values are things that we really need to look at. But I want us to realize that within Caribbean Export, they're recommending that we look at three strategies. Same service, different channel, same infrastructure, different service, and same service, different infrastructure, because we only need to reinvent ourselves, reinvent the way that we're going to be pushing this forward as we move on. And so the sectors of opportunity and COVID-19, they're exactly where Trisha mentioned in terms of the EPA. But I want us to understand also that in-home entertainment, internet of things, the virtual reality, IT services, delivery services, very core. No one wants to go out. I'm afraid to go out. Every time I go out, I feel like I need to come home and sanitize myself and before I enter my home. 
But that digital nomad market that Barbados is jumping on is something that we in Belize needs to look at because we don't need an influx of people rotating through our countries nonstop because movement of people is what causes spreading of this virus. We need to bring in some attractive, high power earning people into this country, put them up in our, in our high level locations, whether it be hotels, villas, guest houses throughout this country, have them stay put and pay towards our taxes, buy um, real estate, ship out, get excited about what Belize has to offer and start creating businesses and exciting our locals and creating jobs for them, bringing in that set um, revenue that is coming in based on, on their retirement funds. And at the same time, being able to play that role of creating that economy where they need housekeepers and they need gardeners and they need to stimulate the Belizean economy because every dollar in the hand of a Belizean person will create economy for us out there. And if the money needs to come in, and that again is exporting of our service environment within the local environment. So in terms of marketing trends, there's a shift from Instagram to Twitter, increase in Facebook usage. Um, and again, a lot of our, of our clients are now shifting on these e-commerce online journeys. And even on, on Belize Ion, the product um, is a service that is being offered within the country. But again, ease of using it. The banks need to create that synergy and that ease of use with acceptance of credit cards and then making credit cards and ePay. And I know B um, Digicel is offering um, ePay very shortly as well. So there are many things, and I know I'm running out of time here, but there are trends to keep on track of with the marketing, um, customizing solutions, looking at every stage, the awareness, the consideration, the purchase, the experience and the advocacy, which um, is the laws and all of that that Trisha mentioned. But we also need to come up with special promotions for that limited time. And when it's over, stop talking COVID. COVID doesn't need to be on our brain for the rest of our lives, but we need to create incentives for our services to get out there and why buy services, whether it be financial services, insurance services, which are doing really well right now, um, delivery door to door, um, and all of these different areas. And of course, the funding support and COVID-19, the governments have made their response, but I want you all to also know that there's a government response global landscape website that you all can check and then make recommendations to our local perspectives of what can be done. Contractual considerations need to change because of COVID-19. So look at your force majeure, look at your contracts, amend them, fix them, seek legal advice before entering into agreements now because you will realize that your agreements from before could be voided and breached the way they stood before. So look at your contracts and the considerations that you had in place because many of us in the service sector will lose everything based on the fact that we don't shift and correct those areas. Um, Trisha mentioned the free movement of people, which is important, but people are looking into Belize as a cancer rehabilitation location. So I hope that our medical and tourism areas look at this, where we have this mass of land and beautiful hotels. Let's create those opportunities. Um, training, um, we will be launching a new series of export training under the Services Go Global, but with COVID-19. I'd like to ask everyone to look out for that because it's very important that we train you on that and the Belize Coalition of Service Providers with the support of, um, with hopefully with funding from Canada, will be able to provide that within the upcoming weeks and look out for postings on that. Again, sharing and support, Canto, um, Caribbean Association of National Telephone Operators, Carilec of the electric operators, Carife of the insurance um, perspectives, Caribbean Court of Justice, quality of service initiatives. All of these networkings play a huge role. And I love the fact that when power lines or telephone lines go down due to hurricane, um, the telecoms environment in Belize and electricity, we share um, people and we share our services and we share our human resources because networking is what is going to help us to be able to continue to survive within this area. So the long-term impacts are many. However, we have to take advantage of the diaspora, the opportunities globally, um, PPEs as norm, extra security as a norm, focusing on the mental health of our people is important because that we are suffering within this time. And all of these, which I know I don't have the time because I, 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 I don't want to, um, I've already overstayed my, my time, 
But I want for everyone out there who is listening to this show right now to understand that you are not too small to export. To succeed in an international market, you do not have to be a large firm. You just have to have large dreams and ready to take your service or product um, to the next level and seek the help from the organizations which are on the ground to help you. And Bell Trade is there, the um, Director General for Foreign Trade, the Belize Coalition of Service Providers on a service perspective. And of course, um, I'm sure the BCCI on an industry perspective and others are there to support as well. So remember, there are a lot of support mechanisms on the ground. Um, this is our roadmap for training that we will be launching very soon. And I don't have a lot of time to talk about that, but I just want you to know that this was created with the help of GIZ, um, the Caribbean Export Department. And if you have any questions for me, um, please send them in the chat or ask them wherever you want. And I'd like to thank you for your time um, today as we were able to do this. So thank you all for inviting us. And if there are any other um, questions for the table. Dr. Timberlin, thank you very much for sharing that presentation. It was very insightful. Like you mentioned, um, something that always sticks out in terms of Belize is, you know, how do we monetize the services um, in terms of the creative industries? You know, how is it that we can have these people earn some type of funding, some type of money, um, some type of um, salary during these times by using their creative, um, their skill sets, in you know seeing and exploring innovative ways to adapt to it and certainly like you mentioned during this time it's important for companies to be innovative and learn how to adapt to the new normal like many, many may say and how is it that they can move forward in terms of implementing technology to move across their services not only in belize but also tapping into markets that could be most beneficial to them um but as the chairman of the Belize Coalition of Service Providers, Dr. Chamberlain, what have been some of the trends in terms of the services um, being offered by members there? Have you seen that they have had an increase in demand? Has it been working out better for them or have they been negatively impacted? That is in terms of serving to other markets. It, I must say that in some areas where they did not um, react quick enough in terms of creating their continuity and recovery plans. Um, those areas, um, there were some hitches. However, I can tell you on the ICT perspective, um, several members have reported to us that they are working within the Caribbean region because of course, a lot of those services can be done on site. But what they've done, like I mentioned, is partnering with other companies within the Caribbean region as well. So they've, they've created those um, Agreements, and I don't know if you're aware, but in February of this year, we actually created a coalition of IT professionals um, for the for the Caribbean region. And so, having created that just in February, I mean, imagine just one month prior, we are now able to mm -hmm. have that net networking and the capability of pulling on a, a, a contemporary for yourself within any other country throughout the Caribbean if you needed support if you need to be there physically and you're not able to travel. Um, one of your own Bell Trade born persons um, is Katia Montenegro. I'm very in mm -hmm. interested and excited about the fact that she realized that she can do her translation services via online, that she doesn't have to physically be at conferences. So yes, she had to change some equipment. She had to change her modus operandi. However, she was able to jump on that. And that's very important that we are able to um, come on board. In reference to myself as a consultant, um, we needed, again, to um, create a consulting a proposal for an organization that needed us to travel in six Caribbean states. And in preparing that proposal, there is no way that I would travel and get quarantined every 14 days and still be able to meet the requirement within a, a three-month period. So again, we were able to contact and network and gain people on the ground who could attend meetings in Barbados for you, attend meetings in St. Lucia, and then come together on a Zoom call like this and report back so we can work. Um, the BMA, the Belize Music um, Agency, I'm very impressed at uh, what they were able to do in reference to virtual concerts. And like I said, John Kuna Productions is creating a comedy one this weekend. 
Um, another era which was very impressive on the advocacy perspective was where the realtors got together and realized that they needed certain um, central bank regulations um, to be um, looked at in reference to being able to sell um, to foreign purchasers. And so again, that area was, was looked at. Again, um, the, the, the acceleration process for doing business where the prime minister mentioned that we would be working on helping to facilitate foreign investment even that and again these are services which promote the use of all of us on the ground on a, on a service perspective so like i said um belize was quick to respond however we now need to keep that momentum but it's important that the leadership can take us there however the followership has to also respond at an equal to speed and pace and shift their service offerings to provide that, which is one of the reasons why we're going to be looking at the capacity building aspect and providing that training. Because some people honestly have thrown their hands up in the air and have become hopeless. We want people to remain hopeful and understand that we are almost at a leveling playing field with the rest of the world. And so this is the time for us to catapult, put ourselves forward and realize that we need to stay on the radar. And that is why it is scary for me that we are not on the radar as a service sector on the Belizean landscape and are only struggling on the external. So I'm, I'm asking everyone, while you are talking about buying local, I mean, I want you all to consider the service sector. We have extremely, I mean, IT professionals in this country. We have extremely wonderful lawyers. We have um, spa um, people, we have, like you said, the, the, the tourism environment. There are different ways to still utilize that. We, the service industry, brokers, um, the, the training aspect of it. A lot of our, us are purchasing trainings abroad and webinars. We're putting in money there. While, while a lot of this expertise with, with local perspective, I would say let's buy regional. Let's support our region's growth at this point in time and see how well we can actually accelerate it forward. Um, basically, um, we are able to do in any sector that we want. We just can't sit back. It's not going to happen for us normally. And the new norm right. is the new form. It's called reality. Wake up, eat it, accept it, and move on and embrace how you can gain that space that some people are not filling. So the market is even wider for you right now if you want to explore. Right, that's certainly. And just to um, wrap up in terms of services, uh, like you mentioned, we have so many, um, so much potential in terms of consultancy, in terms of attorney um, services, and even with that, just when you think about it, um, we have so many contact centers, and I love talking about them because across we have been speaking on, you know, education, and a couple of them are doing English education to some of Asian students. So a lot of the services here in Belize, and even in terms of the talent that we have, is being exported that's regionally and even internationally. Some of the contact centers right now are exporting as far as Australia, Asia, and it's just amazing. And our call center um, market, Belize's call centers. Again, local businesses could contemplate using local call centers for their customer service entities as well. So that they're able, I mean, because the reality is if, if, if American firms can be using local call centers for their customer service, why is it that we also can't ensure that that environment stays alive as well? Because as companies are closing down in America, our call centers are getting vacant seats. We need to make sure that we continue to fill those seats so that that part of the market, which, which hires most, a lot of Belize's youth, um, you know, uh, it, it stays alive during this period until when the rest of the world rebounds and can then retake over back that part of the market. That is very much so. And um, we certainly look forward to continue working with the Belize Coalition of Service Providers and everyone there. Um, Dr. Chamberlain, thank you very much for those insights. It has been very helpful, you know, in identifying potential areas that we can strengthen on a whole. So thank you very much for the work that you're doing there too and for always being so open in collaborating with us at Bell Trade. So thank you very much. And thank now you. with that... Thank yes, you. certainly. And now, last but not least, we have uh, Mr. Nikita Usher. 
Um, he's the group marketing and sales manager at the Citrus Products of Belize Limited. And he's going to be sharing with us a little bit of their experience as a private company, you know, in exporting to CARICOM from a goods perspective. What have been some of the opportunities that they have identified and how has the process been going, you know, throughout this experience in exporting to CARICOM markets. So, Mr. Usher, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you as well, Liani, and thank you to Beltrade. Uh, welcome to the other group members who are on the panel. Um, I certainly won't be as, as long as Dr. Chamberlain. I know her presentation was <laughs> quite long, but very, very informative. And I won't be as long because it's nearing that 12 o'clock hour, so I'm smelling food already. Um, for the most part, though, I think the topic here was saying, uh, let's make with talk business and I thought that that would have been a more interactive way of dealing with it rather than doing presentations and the public then not understanding some of it. So let me start off in saying what we do. Um, we are one of those entities that export into CARICOM indeed. Um, we are the buyers of 99% of the oranges and grapefruits that are produced in this country and we take that product and an important point that I will make is that we take that product and utilizes every single component of it there's nothing that goes to waste. We have bought all those oranges and grapefruits and convert them first into concentrated juice, which is a whole product. We have also value add that product into a tetra pack and other juice, juice sizes or juice mix and styles. We've also done blends with them. So that's another market segment as well. But we have extracted from that orange all the pulp cells, all the oils, the aromas, the essences, and we have taken the waste that most people would think as a skin and all the mm -hmm. albinos inside, the seeds and all of that, and we have converted that into a cattle feed. So there is nothing that really physically goes to waste once we purchase that orange from a grower. That makes us a very environmentally friendly organization. We don't throw anything away and we make a revenue out of everything that we purchase. Um, so we have several components to the business. I will admit that CARICOM contributes to about 45% now of our entire sales makeup. 45 to 50% is what we're going into CARICOM with. That's very important for us because that's a market that we call our premium market. It's a market that we cherish. It's a market that we work hand in hand with the Ministry of Foreign Trade to ensure that we secure. And I do believe that we have an excellent relationship with that department from the standpoint that we are alerted as Trisha mentioned on the CET. Now, one of the, I, I like Dr. Chamberlain's last presentation, you don't have to be big to export into CARICOM. But I think what we have to learn in Belize is that we don't make the mistakes that some of us have made in the past. And that statement should have ended in saying, you know, like when you're going to school, you have your big brother holding you going to school and walking you and teaching you the ropes into getting into school when you're an infant. I think we should do the same in Belize in the business forums. We should be teaching our younger organizations, the smaller ones just coming up, to not make the same mistakes that many of us have made in the past. The challenge that we always have, of course, is that as Belizeans, we feel like, mm -hmm. and I will say this and I will be clear in how I'm saying it, I don't want to upset anybody, but we feel as if though we must always try on our own. We don't really need that big brother approach. But I, I'm honest and I'm saying this from the bottom of my heart that I know that these mistakes can be costly and very, very costly. We should ensure that we have our smaller entities, the younger ones coming up. Despite how small they are, they can export. I agree, Dr. Chamberlain, but we should make sure that we don't have them make the same mistakes. These mistakes sometimes causes flops, causes businesses to roll, to fall apart. Now, what do we need to get into CARICOM? What, has, what we have faced with, and I will say, Although I say about 40% to 50% goes into CARICOM, we do have a situation where the balance of our product goes into other marketplaces, Europe, USA, Asia, Central America, South America as well. So we are, we are touring the globe. But what we have learned over the years is that CARICOM, while being a slow at adopting, they have now started to adopt what other first world marketplaces have also uh, had in the past. So for example, getting, getting into the European market, we were required to have a number of certification programs mm -hmm. and certification programs that can be extremely costly. 
all the more reasons why I'll discuss later why we should have this big, big brother approach in dealing with these markets. When you get into a European market situation, the, the requirements are huge, they're tall. The US was almost similar. And now we're starting to see CARICOM requiring not as much, but coming very close behind what they're asking us to have as a product. The product must come with quality, certain standards. It must have a certification that is backing it, an accredited certification. In this case, we are talking quality management systems, ISOs, uh, HACCP plans. You have to have BRC certifications, for example, SGF certification, depending on which marketplace you're going into. CARICOM is slowly becoming similar to what we're seeing in these first world marketplaces. Now, these, these cost money. And I do know that for some time, I think last year, just before COVID, um, there's been some great work trying to be done by Baja in trying to have other companies in Belize similarly certified to those who are able to have certifications. When we face these type of challenges, it's going to be the customer then has that demand to say, if you don't have it, then I don't really need your product. And that's when CET starts to become the challenge. Because when they can't see you supplying it because you don't have it, then they go and apply for what they want, a suspension for the product to come out of a first world country. And then that comes to, as Trisha explained, private sector writing to Coated, asking for consideration for these goods to come in duty free. Fortunately, if you go to the Coated rules, there is nothing that is listed to say that you has, uh, the rules are still perhaps a little old. There's nothing in there as far as to my best of my knowledge that says that certification was a requirement. And so we've been able to argue that for most times. It will probably soon change, however. And so we must always remember that that's a given that has to take place urgently. Dr. Chamberlain spoke about the uses of uh, the use of Belizean expertise. Let me use the certification when I know that Baja was having tremendous challenges trying to find local individuals to do these type of trainings. So I think if our universities are to be looking at areas for new scope and new development, these are areas that we have to certainly look at. The education platform has to change to suit where the requirements of markets are. My, my saying to hold hands and, and, and being the big brother is quite often, and I will say it from the other side of the investment standpoint, to get these investments done is gonna cost huge chunks of money and even to maintain them. I'm talking certification. So quite often what we have actually lent to a number of organizations is to have TPBL packing your product for you using the good name of what we have, using the certification so that you don't have to then go and do that investment all over. As I opened up, I said, let's not make the same mistakes that a lot of us have made. That has been an extended service that we have opened over the last year. Um, we've had, again, I know COVID is in front of us and I like the discussion of what is happening on Dr. Chamberlain's side in terms of the COVID side. We have had a number of businesses who have now visited us, who have now come in to us, can you pack this on our behalf rather than us going in to do the investment? That comes, of course, with confidentiality. That comes, of course, with a, a meaning of trust, a, a little bit of trust, which is sometimes a little difficult for us as Belizeans to appreciate around ourselves. Um, business people feel like if I tell you where I want to do, you want to take away my business for me and you want to close me down and the rest of it goes on. Now, those are some of the challenges that we are seeing. Nonetheless, we've been able to have some meaningful discussion with a number of entities that we can pack their product on their behalf and then move on to say, um, we can ship out your product on your behalf with your name. It's your product. I have no really meaning for having it. It's just us packing it using our name as a packing agent. That's a very good plan. Um, going into CARICOM, the challenge that we'll have is to maintain consistency. Consistency from a quality standpoint and consistency from a supply standpoint. We cannot go in there one month and say that we're supplying product and the following month, then we're faced with a problem where we're saying, I run out of stocks, I can't supply you because on the value added side of the business, that is shelf space that you would have lost on the, on the supermarket shelves. If you don't maintain consistency, we're gonna be in problems. And that is a huge challenge that Belizean businesses will be faced. We ourselves sometimes are faced with it. Many times it's because of reasons beyond our control. A recent port closure was a, was a case in point. 
We, we had 22 containers that had to be moving out of Belize that was unable to move for a period of next to 10 days as when the port was closed. How do we explain to a customer that you're having issues at the port when these are goods that has to be on the shelves? When your product is not on the shelf, somebody else's product takes the shelf space. I know you got to fight back to get that space in. I like the comment made earlier. You asked the question of, Tricia, how do you get those customers in CARICOM? Market survey is important. You know, when we were having the de-risking issue some years ago, there's a new phrase or a new clause. I call it new, but perhaps in the banking world, it was not new. There's a clause that we call KYC, know your customers. That is equally important in doing business in CARICOM. You need to know who you're doing business with. Um, we have been able to use the Chamber of Commerce in the, in the different regions to find out, give me a heads up, give me a little due diligence on this individual business. Can we do business with them? Um, and we've been able to get some good feedback from that and be able to open up business. To be honest on the matter, we have not had, except for one instance, we have not had much of a challenge or problems with customers in CARICOM. They think like Belize, they move like Belize, they might move a little faster than Belizeans, um, but, but we are similar in the way we operate. So we've been able to be very successful in going into CARICOM. I do a visit annually into CARICOM to make sure my customers are seeing my face. Um, I can't always be doing it virtually, even without no COVID, no, I've had to be doing it virtually. So we do these Zoom arrangements with them at least once per quarter to understand what their market is or some of the challenges they're facing uh, and how we can assist. To be honest, and there's another side of this equation, when you're dealing with value add and quoted is so important, what we've found out now is that our CARICOM brothers have now found ways to try and disguise the product that you're bringing in. So they do know that they have to buy orange juice in this case from Belize because we are now pretty much only the only Caribbean member state that is producing orange juice. I'm using my example. And so what they do now, they come and they put a carrot mixed with the orange juice in there to say, well, you can supply that. So I have to now get a suspension to bring in a carrot orange juice mix. And if we're not cautious about it, when you look at it, 98% of it is orange juice and 2% of it is, is carrot. We have to be vigilant. That's where foreign trade works uh, with the private sector. And if we as private sectors are not vigilant about it, it will pass through and then it becomes a market open up for that displaces our product inside that marketplace. What we've been able to do is to put in a blending house in, how, in, in country, in Belize, in our own facility to blend any flavors that you want. You want carrot in there, I'll blend it for you. So there's no longer a reason for you to say to me that I can't supply what you want. So we have a sophisticated blend house. I can buy computers, tell him, put in two of this and five of this, and that's what turns out to be. That's the flavor that you get. That's an investment that we've had to do because of these changes in the marketplace. But you need to understand what the market is doing. And we'll only know that by visiting, by having these conferences with them, understanding your, your customer's market so that you can adopt and make the changes on your side. Again, I say, if every entity was to do that, then you'll put in that investment all over again. But the blending house that we have here can facilitate any customer that wants to utilize it, utilize that blend house and then make their product accordingly. Uh, so networking is so important um, locally. I've heard Dr. Chamberlain said that. That's a very, very true point. In the productive sector, we are the same. We must learn how to produce or uh, assist ourselves in producing what is the product that we want to get out of here. On the, on the marketing side, what we have also done, and that I kind of did when I was heading the chamber, is to look at when I was traveling, a lot of the times when we were dealing with the smaller island states, they're not able to move, in my case, juice as readily as we may want to have them move it. So we've been able to tag team a number of businesses together to package a product that goes into a container. So rather than sending one container every three or four months of orange juice, I am now sending one container, mixed container, every two months. So I am packaging along with Glorious. I'm packaging along with Caribbean paper. So when my container leaves Belize, it's leaving Belize now with not just orange juice, but it's going with, with four or five other Belizean products going into the smaller island states. And you can then move more containers per year, as opposed if you're only drinking about it from a juice standpoint. That ends up becoming a very, again, networking. Again, that's an issue that Sometimes some businesses don't want to do it. 
And so their reluctance on their part to try and do it for whatever reasons, whether it's trust, whether it's um, fear of what you would put in there, uh, whatever that case may be, um, it is a development of a network that you must now understand that if you're going to be doing that, there is a risk involved in doing all of that. What has happened now with us in CARICOM post COVID? Um, understanding the market is one issue, but a new development now is the ability to pay. All of us are impacted and, and our marketplace now is now swamped now with products going in and whether or not that country is able to pay. There's the issue of foreign exchange on their side. And in, under the Belize law, once you've shipped out a product exporting, you are entitled to bring back foreign currency, hard currency, meaning US dollars. We have had uh, cases in point, several cases where the customer is now requesting us to pay in different hard currency. So paying in Canadian, paying in Euro rather than in US. Our banks have to adopt to these type of changes. And this is gonna become, I like the comment made, this is gonna become the new norm. Um, I don't see that changing. That's gonna to have to be a consistent change. And I like the idea, of course, I have to support that. Our contracts now have to change to not read only US dollars now, but also now adopt to the wording of hard currency and what hard currency will be acceptable and how will we deal with those payments. But that's, that's an issue that is coming post COVID and I suspect that that's gonna continue even beyond and for another few years. Another challenge that you're faced with is that our banking now have to start to adopt now that sales can't be as normal. Uh, where you may have had a contract that may have had, and the comment made earlier, you have to now change your contracts. Where you may have had a contract that would have been allowing you to have deliveries on a specific time, whether it is a challenge on our side because of a port or because of supply reasons, there's also the other side where they might not be able to receive your product. So your cash flow now starts to crunch because you're expecting revenues to come back in or inflows to come back and your banks are saying, but I'm not seeing your, your inflows, but I'm still seeing outflows. Again, that's becoming a new challenge on the Belizean front. Um, but we've been able to manage and I, I, I've seen where our banks have been very flexible with that. While understanding, there's still some reluctance on some part, but very understanding. And, and, and we've had some changes to make the difference on that. Um, the importance, again, is the experience of going into what is the government's role in all of this? The government role is to ensure that we have the en enabling environment to operate. We, the private sector, don't go to quoted meetings. It's the government that goes to quoted. It is important that the government understands what is happening on the private sector front. Many times we, we are faced with challenges at quoted that may not have been discussed prior to leaving. And so that is an important framework that I would have encouraged ministers of trade to have that discussion with their private sector counterparts before actually departing for that quoted meeting. Because too often we have seen instances where that call comes back while you're on the front line. And it's a difficult thing to try and arrange. Uh, the sugar one was very, very upfront. We've been able to gather all that data going into the sugar negotiation, but I'm talking on other fronts. The other areas of concern that we may have is um, understanding the supply side for you to operate on the export market. You know, I am aware of certain entities in certain countries, particularly Barbados, and I'm speaking here on, on behalf of all, but I'll say what is happening in Barbados. They are entities similar to ours, but they don't have an agricultural base. And so they don't have a raw material that is called citrus or, or hardly any much of a sugar or any other agricultural product in a large quantity. And so a firm that would be producing similar to ours, for example, juices, for example, would have to import these concentrated juices from overseas. Let us say that it's a product that is not made in Belize or any member state. That means that it has to come from elsewhere, from another, let's say, first world, let's say US, let us say Central America. But in these CARICOM countries, they are allowed to bring it in duty free because it's called manufacturing. And it's an entity that they are promoting manufacturing in their country. But if we were to do that in Belize, we are faced with tremendous duties. So the playing field is not level. They, they, to be competitive, we put Belizean businesses at a disadvantage. Because now, and I'll use an example, Apple. 
Nobody produces apple around here. But if we want to process apple, I would have to pay duties on apple concentrate coming into Belize. A similar entity like Bar in Barbados would pay no duty on the apple coming in because they have a manufacturing sector that is huge that demands from the government that these things are duty exempted because it's intended to create a manufacturing business out of it. Now that same juice will be exported to Belize to sell in Belize and around CARICOM, but that juice is already less duty than what that Belizean product will end up being. These are the areas that government has to assist and must find ways. We, accordingly, I understand from the ministries that that is the rules of origin discussion. But yet in Barbados, the rule of origin seemingly does not apply. And yet we are supposed to be in one regime. So these are some of the challenges that we are facing as Belizean entities. We are pricing ourselves out of business. We are becoming uncompetitive when we go into the marketplace, even on the local front when we're there. That in my mind has to be an entity that has to be addressed and addressed very quickly because it discourages small businesses from wanting to operate, from being even able to compete locally and overseas. And so the issue of not having to be a big company to export is valid, but that is providing the level playing field is available to all. So as government, that is where I would say that if we're to make a change, that's what I would suggest to us to make the change. Um, when we look at the, I like the joining forces. What we've been seeing now is what CPBL have had to now do is with a disease plaguing us on the citrus side, we've been able to take one of the other processing plants. We had two processing plants. And we've now started to what we call diversify. We've taken the second plant now and started to encourage growers. And that has been, we did this since last year. I would want to think around July, August last year, and it's been a tremendous fly. Um, when we look at the entities that we're talking about, we've been able to convert now the second plant into now doing processing of other products, tropical products. Because for the most part, the bulk of the plant would be remain the same, evaporation, centrifuging, uh, juice finishing would always be the same, only the extraction side would change. And so we've now started a new product, pineapple on a wider scale. We've done this year since introducing this, we've done a million pounds of pineapple, which we've never done in history. Um, and next year should be about 6 million pounds of pineapple and it continues to grow. By 2023, we should be around 25 million pounds of pineapple processing, all for CARICOM market. Once that is done, then we can now start to do the lobbying with CARICOM and Coated to try and see how we can get that becoming a product that doesn't need now, that will need now to request suspension for such. We've also converted the plant to also do sour sop. Sour sop market is a huge marketplace. We're processing, we just did 55,000 pounds of sour sop only last month. And we're doing scheduled to do another run in December, uh, which will be about uh, 550,000 pounds of sour sop. And thereafter it graduates up into getting into end product by 2022 should be around 50 million pounds of sour sop per year is what we're exporting. That again has an export market already arranged, um, set and ready to go. We're actually supplying it in a slow pace right now and showing where we can grow it to that point. The third phase of that same plant is to then do coconut and all the byproducts of product of the of the of the uh, the fruit. I open up my discussion in saying our plant, our mantra is that we don't waste a single component of any fruit that we process. So when we're looking at coconuts, we'll be looking at all that can be done from coconut, whether it's powder, whether it's milk, whether it's water, whether it's charcoal, whether it's coconut oil, whatever can be done from it, we will be doing. That is the aim for 2021. We have already had two companies who have now visited us asking for us to consider processing on their behalf. Again, using the, perhaps, and I'll use it, the good name of what we have developed over the years. This has now become the mantra. People don't want to have to go and do those investments all over. And so I end in saying to you, let us hold the hands of those smaller entities as we work hand in hand to try and get the Belizean product outside of Belize. The CARICOM market is an, excellent market. It is one that we don't want to lose. 
It is one that understands how we do business. It was one that we understand how they do business. And so we should not lose sight of that market any at all. Yeah, I hope I've answered what you, has, what you have asked. And if you have any questions, I'm open for those. Um, it was very clear, uh, Mr. Usher, we very much appreciate the openness of CPBL to be one of those companies, you know, who's open to share your experiences along the way. Not only the good moments, but also those um, learning lessons that you have had along the way. Um, something that caught my attention a lot is the collaborative measure measures that you are taking to support you know those companies who are looking to diversify but maybe may not have the financial capabilities now to do that large investment and it's very commendable that cpbl is saying well hey you know companies if you're interested in doing this this is how we can help you this is how we can collaborate with you um you also mentioned the areas that you would need support from government in and for me, it's very important that as private sector, you know, you find ways to approach government and letting them know if it's in the um, monetary system, system is if it's items there that need to be amended, if the regulations need to be updated, that is key. Because um, like you mentioned, communication plays a vital role, whether it's in the regulations and even in terms of communicating our, um, our interests to other member states along the um, CARICOM region. So for us, that's something that I'm sure that DGFT, Tricia, Ms. Gideon has noted um, in ways in how we can collaborate with one another. And in closing, I was going to ask you actually what are some of the opportunities, but you were very clear in saying, you know, that you're diversifying into other um, fruits, not only into the traditional fruits that we're used to here in Belize, but also in seeing into those seasonal crops that we have, like pineapple, soursop, and other purees that can be produced and concentrates. So on a whole, thank you very much for that very informative. Yeah, um, one, that, one that I didn't mention actually, and I actually had a meeting very quickly. And the minute you say it on the media or any place I go to, it becomes like a buzzword. Is passion fruit. Passion grows in Belize so wild and so easily. Uh, it's, it's a huge market for it. And if Trisha was to share with you some of the demands that comes out at CARICOM, I'm sure that that would be listed as one of them as well. And so we have looked at that option as well. Uh, since we are diversifying one of the plants into tropical fruit, that's an area that we're also looking into. I've already had several calls from people who are saying, well, I can plant that for you now and have it for you in 18 months which is enough time for us to have the plant ready and able to process it as well. Um, so, so those are the type of discussions that we're having. We're diversifying as much as we can, um, trying to adopt those companies who are having challenges in there. Rather than have them go and invest all over again, we've been able to offer some of the services. A most recent one that occurred last, only last week was, uh, we have a full-fledged laboratory in here that has to match up to the certification program. Um, there are some entities here that has to do testing of their products on a weekly basis. We've been able to receive their samples from them and test their samples for them and give them their results, which is something that we've never done in the past. We've always kind of kept it to the chest in terms of what we have to <laughs> offer. We've kind of opened it up a bit now and have people now start to appreciate what we do and give them, rather than them going into putting a whole laboratory for themselves, which will cost them money, um, we have now opened up that for them as well. On the agricultural side, we're putting in a laboratory now to do testings for them, soil, leaf, down the line, so that the growers don't make mistakes on that side of the business. And again, opening it up to the entire general public for them to attract and come in and have the services available to them. And if I'm to end on Dr. Chamberlain's words, um, I hope I'm not one of those entities that are not using Belizean expertise and services because we use only Belizean. <laughs> we are pro-Belizean. And I end with that note. I thank you very much. And that's excellent, Mr. Usher. And I'm sure for everyone viewing, they now know that, you know, they can approach CPBL in terms of testing, also in terms of diversifying their products. And we very much appreciate that. Thank you for being a company, you know, that is so open and so uh, much into helping other companies grow. And I'm certain that if any of them would ever have any questions in terms of exporting to CARICOM, they can reach out to you, Mr. Not Usher. A problem at all. Not a problem. Yeah.
<laughs> but thank you very much um, the, from the DJFT to um, the Belize uh, Coalition of Service Providers and CPBL for joining us today and sharing your experiences and also um, possible opportunities that we can see in CARICOM markets and also here in Belize on a whole. So thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Great presentation, Nikita. Have a thank you. Day. Yes. You all. Enjoy the thank rest you. of the day. Thank you. Enjoy too. <laughs>